Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to a very special night at the Old Globe. I'm going to open with a sentence that I have said many, many times in the year that I have been here in San Diego. But tonight, that sentence is a little odd. It goes like this. Good evening. I'm Barry Edelstein, the artistic director of the Old Globe. <laughs> The, the, the reason that tonight it is odd is that in the house is the artistic director <laughs> of the Old Globe. So it's a little bit complicated uh, how to start this evening, except to note how incredibly thrilled I am and honored I am to be able to share the stage with someone who's not only one of the giants in my field, but someone who has been great and generous and deeply, deeply kind to me in the, in the year that I've had this job. We have launched a, a series that we call In Conversation With because we believe two things are true. One is that a theater is not simply a place of entertainment and of uh, uh, storytelling and of emotional transformation, but it is also a place of intellectual content. A theater should be a place where ideas are discussed and that brings real intellectual depth to the community in which it's located. So we have launched a series where we can invite some of the luminaries in fields in the theater and related to the theater to come and share with our audience their insights about this work, about how this work relates to the larger society. And uh, I'm very thrilled tonight to have uh, so far the second in this In Conversation series. And we'll be announcing more as the season goes on. The second reason we're doing it is that we uh, have made a renewed commitment at the Globe to sharing our creative process with our audience, to opening the doors, to pulling back the curtain, and to sharing with our supporters how we do what we do so that when they come and see our shows, they have a deeper appreciation for it. So thank you all for coming tonight. I assure you, uh, you're in for a treat. Uh, all of you know Jack O'Brien, but it's my obligation and my pleasure to introduce him to the few of you who may not. Jack was the artistic director of the Old Globe from 1981 to 2007. He is a winner of three Tony Awards and at least one of every other major American <laughs> theater award. He holds an honorary doctorate from his alma mater, the University of Michigan, where later this week he will be traveling to be the subject of, uh, of a great honorary dinner and uh, performance. And we're all glad that he was able to squeeze San Diego in on the way to that big gala. He has directed six productions on PBS for American Playhouse, many, many productions at the Lincoln Center Theater, including a wonderful production of the Scottish play now running in New York that I had the pleasure of seeing last week when I was uh, back east for Thanksgiving. He's directed opera, but of course his great fame comes from the many Broadway musicals he has directed, many of which started right on this very stage, including Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, The Full Monty, Damn Yankees, Catch Me If You Can, Hairspray, and on and on and on. His range is astonishing. Uh, as a director myself, all I can tell you is I am blown away by the number of different genres uh, at his command, from Shakespeare to other world classics to new American plays. Frankly, he is truly one of the giants in the American theater. Ladies and gentlemen, Jack O'Brien. Don't waste it. <laughs> Jack, welcome home. Boy, what I was saying to the kids backstage, uh, I wasn't quite prepared for the wave of nostalgia that hit me when I hit town today, realizing I was going to spend this time with you. And um, the circumstances under which I am so generously brought here by Barry to have this evening with you, celebrate the book, and see people I not only love, but who were instrumental in every phase of the development of my own career. And uh, I, I, I need to say publicly, because this has never happened before, uh, my appreciation to you for doing this. It means the world to me. Believe well, thank me. you, Jack. And, uh, 
And you, you got the right guy. Oh, come now. You did. That's, you got the right guy. Thank you. You're very sweet to say so. Thank you, Jack. And of course, the reason we're here tonight, the, the, the proximate reason anyway, is the publication of this extraordinarily wonderful book, which I enjoyed just tremendously. And I, I want that to be the, um, at the core of what we talk about today, although selfishly, I also wouldn't mind if you take me through the user's manual to the old globe. So maybe we can, <laughs> we can do that. But Jack and, I are gonna, Jack and I are heading out to dinner after the, uh, after the event tonight when I'm going to get him to tell me like where the light switches are. And, <laughs> And also, I've been meaning to tell you, you left a very large pair of shoes in the office <laughs> that I'm struggling to fill and not quite managing. So I really should probably return them to they're, you. They're Tom you Halls, I think. <laughs> <laughs> very, very good. Jack, let me, let me talk, before we get into what's in the book, let me talk to you about writing. Uh, I, I've written two books myself, and I know how weird it is to be someone who spends his life reading other people's writing and then suddenly trying to put a sentence together. You've been writing a long time. There, you, you talk about in the book your, your journal keeping and there's this extraordinary section in the back where you give us your, your reportage of a, of a Chekhov production that you were involved in. You're an amazing writer even then when you must have been in your very early 20s. Um, so, what, Talk about yourself, if you would. Uh, you know, when did you start writing? Uh, in what forms have you written? And, and then we'll get to w what you actually wrote here. Yeah. It, I, I almost don't know how to answer the question, Barry. Um, I look at the book. I'm sort of astonished it exists. Uh, <laughs> I, I know I wrote it. I, 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 I'm pretty sure I lived it. Uh, I knew I had an imp impulse to do so. Uh, and this crowd of people know more than anybody else because they have borne witness to the fact that um, a huge, I think, I think there's to be another book, and it's this book, isn't it, about the movement, about what brought me to Craig and to you, and what was happening in the country with Des across the street and Danny Sullivan up the coast and Mark Lamos and all of us uh, with our what I call AAA ball teams um, in the 80s and the 90s, changing an industry that had seemed moribund, hmm. basically. Uh, and I felt a great obligation. I, I have always expressed that in this hall to Craig Knoll, who was uh, one of my significant fathers, John Houseman being another one. Um, I think because my father died when I was 18, I think because he was 13 years older than my mother, so he was an older father to me. I mean, he, uh, dad was in his 40s, mid-40s, I think, mid-late 40s when I was born. Um, so I revere these, these guys, these titans, and uh, I felt an obligation. I, I felt it every day that I, I, I worked here. Uh, and to carry on the quality of personal work that was so indigenous to Craig Knoll as an artistic director and to the community that supported him. Mm -hmm. So I had, I had that in my mind. Uh, as far as the writing goes, I, I, I'm Irish. <laughs> <laughs> That's as good an answer. That is as good an answer as any. That really is. Yeah. I'm just a sort of word drunk, you know? Yeah. And I've always been that way. I'm, I'm that way when I talk to you. I'm that, that's what everybody says they hear me in the book. Yeah, well, sure. sure. It's the only voice I have, you yeah. know? So are, are you, did you keep journals as a kid? Did you? Uh, uh, I tried. Uh, I, I have a very fond memory of myself in a sort of tartan robe and little <laughs> bedroom slippers, sitting about eight years old, writing in a big tome that I wanted to keep, and I, you know, I, I did a paragraph, and I, I was in love with, I've been in love with images a, a lot, and I, the idea of me as a writer was appealing, until I lost my hair, the idea of <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of writers I, have lost their hair. Well, I know, but Shakespeare, I for example. Yeah, but he, yeah, well, he did, but he didn't lose it as early as I did. Because <laughs> <laughs> we were in school together. Right. <laughs> and you knew. Yeah. 
Uh, you, you, you could have given him some advice about that mustache. I did. Did you? He didn't take it. Yeah. Never. Right. He never listened to me. Well. He doesn't listen to me now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I, 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 you know, I was, I, I loved the idea of the way words sound together. I loved other people's language. I loved, I loved uh, reporting uh, what other people said. I don't have, by the way, any, any journals from these years. Amazing. So, so let me ask you this then. One of the things I noticed reading the book is you have a, an impeccable memory specifically for the clothes people I know. wear. Amazing. <laughs> now, you know, I mean, it's a... You think I'm going to forget those socks? No, sir. Why, why, why do you think I wear them? Why else would one wear them? Um, you know, obviously, you're a, you're a theater director. You look at costumes. You give notes about costumes. But it actually is impressive throughout the, the and I thought, well, nobody can remember in that detail unless they're a memoirist, unless. So there clearly, there's, a, there's, a, there's an impulse that goes back to the earliest part of your life that, that is recording, that is uh, memorializing, that is, that is taking note. And um, you know, it, it's obvious, and I'm, I'm almost as curious about that as I am about whatever instinct it was that started you on the path toward being a theater director, because it feels to me like they're related. I right? had, a, I had a, a sort of crossover as a child. It's even in the book where I say, as a child on a tricycle, I remember feeling incredibly well, a great sense of well-being and, and comfort. And, and as I said, the word that I believed that was in my mind at that point was that I was inevitable. It's an odd thing for a tiny child to think about, but I, I knew somehow, I knew I was different, and I knew that I was marked in some odd way, and I was always aware that I was around extraordinary people. Hmm. Uh, I don't know if anybody, this is, a, this is not even in the book, I don't know if anybody here is a poetry buff, but if, does the name Theodore Retke mean anything to any of you? Okay, so occasionally. All right. the, he, he, di he died in, in the 50s, and he was a Yale younger poet, but he was a, an American poet that came from Michigan, came from Saginaw. And his sister, June, was my ninth grade English teacher. And she was a big, unbelievably unattractive woman. <laughs> Some, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip this now. Sometimes teachers are beautiful in different ways. She set the bar so high. She was ferocious. She was terrifying. And to be in her journalism class or her English class was a great mark of distinction. And I achieved it. And I swear, she, used to, she, be, she never spoke of her brother. She never read his poetry to us, but she read aloud poetry to us. And there are sections of that poetry that I've never seen on the page that I can recite to this day. I was paying attention. Mm -hmm. And I knew that in some odd way, I was bearing witness. My father was hilarious, his friends, his best friend was Gerald Marx, who wrote All of Me. Hmm. So there was a lot of fringe showbiz going on there. Mm -hmm. um, I was always dumped into the steaming pot of really interesting creative people. Right. And, and, and I'm, you know, I'm, this is not a joke. I've never thought I was very special. I, I know I've got a great ability, and I know that I have gifts, and I'm grateful for them. But I never really thought I was very hot shit, frankly. <laughs> and I think other people are. Hmm. I think all the people in this book yeah. seem to me to be giants to me. Right. So I was privileged to be with them. They were kind to me. They were personal. They took an interest in me. They liked me. Yeah. I was a bright, funny young kid. And so I was a good audience. And there's nothing better. Sure. 
particularly with people, with people with endless anecdotes, yeah. as you're now yeah. hearing. Sure, of course. <laughs> yeah. No, and, and, and one of the truly impressive things about the book is the amount of love for those people that you managed to get onto the page. It's just clear that you relished and adored all of them yeah. and loved being around them. And that's, that's, a, that's a truly wonderful thing. Um, and I, I think may relate to the teaching and mentoring that you've done once you established yourself as, as, as a serious major figure in the American theater, because I know that that's been a big, big part of your career. It is. It seems to me that you're trying to create in other young people coming up that same sense of love and warmth that you had for those giants that you were around. Right? That's why the book. Is that not true? I mean, and that, that's, that, yeah, yeah, I mean. That's why the book. I felt there's, a lot has been given to me. A lot has been lavishly given to me. And you can't spend time telling everybody about it. Uh, I'm, I have no children of my own, so they become, that investment becomes my contribution. Mm -hmm. And it's very important to me. I take it very yeah. seriously. And, and, and the book works on a, a lot of levels, including as a work of history about a period that might have been forgotten had not you decided to write it down. Well, that was the goad. Um, one of the New York writers about three years ago was lamenting the fact because they're all so anglophilic there. I mean, anything that comes from England, they just put their foreheads to the floor and say, this is the best thing in the world. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> yeah. it's a regional company in Leeds, you know? <laughs> good for them, they're not as good as this. Yeah. These, these are the people who will, no. These are the people who will not cross the Hudson River to see what's out here but they will go to, New to London and see any piece of crap and say, this is the way to do it. This is the way to do it. Um, preach it, brother. You now, can use me, you can. Uh, I, I intend to, are you kidding? I intend to. Jack, uh, w a metaphor that informs the memoir aspect of the book. The book, is, the book is, I think, three things. The book is a memoir of your own personal uh, journey toward being a director, the accidental education of an unintentional director, as you call it. It's also, as I said, a history of this extraordinary period of creativity in the American theater. It's also a love story between you and this man, Ellis Rabb, that we will talk about later in the evening. The memoir part of it is, is driven by this metaphor of pinball, that you're a pinball being batted around. Will you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I didn't have a thought in my head when I was in high school. I mean, these were innocent times back there in the 50s, the 40s and the 50s. We were babies that staggered out of the end of the World War II, where the period where America emerged heroic and victorious with white hats and doing the right thing and standing up for, for all the values that were important. And uh, our parents, who came through the Depression, struggled, uh, really struggled. And so it was important that the children not struggle, that we feel loved and cosseted and cuddled and secure. And I think we did. Hmm. But it didn't engender in me a particular fire uh, or a purpose. Um, I went to school. Um, with a lot of my little friends. I, you know, did what kids did. Uh, I was not very experimental. I was not very brave. Uh, and then suddenly, I got to the University of Michigan, and it was, just, it was fabulous. It was, that was like a, an education in itself. All these East Coast kids coming in, mm -hmm. all these intellectuals, uh, very different from anything I had known. I didn't have a thought as to what I was going to do in my life. Then my father dies my freshman year. So there goes that sort of pole out of my, you know, there's not even a reference. Gee, Dad, what do you think I should do? Should I go into the family business? What is the family business? He was a, he did, he was a sort of salesman. He was a sort of a, a, a jack of all trades in an odd way. That was no 
Well, I ended up doing that, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> but, but, uh, I, I, but I had this burning desire to show off. <laughs> you know, I could sing, I could dance, I could write little songs. Uh, I, I, I wanted the approval. You know, that what a terrible addiction that is to, for a director to get over. Yeah. Which you have to do. I mean, fascinating that I have, uh, I, the most vulnerably sort of uh, person who wants and love and approval as much as I do, should find myself in a career in which it is implicit that I have to tell the truth. <laughs> because you can be everybody's best friend, mm. but if you don't tell the truth, you leave them. They can't trust you. And so to force myself to be honest, about myself, mm -hmm. with myself, with my circumstances. Yeah. It was a, it was a, that's what I was doing. Right. And anyway, I found myself performing. Right. And then when, oddly enough, I think, I thought because my fa one of my father's best friends was a federal judge, uh, Frank Picard, in Detroit. And uh, I was very impressed. He was, he was something. And I thought, oh, I think I'll just go into law. Because it looks so good. <laughs> sort of theatrical, you know? Very much so, yeah. And then when my dad died, that little joke, that little canard went away. And I began seriously to think about writing. Because I was writing lyrics and music and creating musical comedies at the university. And, and making a reputation for myself. And I thought, and then I met Bob James, right. jazz artist, Bob James. Sure. And he was serious. And he made me take it seriously. So I sort of bounced into it. I have always been caroming around through the influence of powerful people who I not only was attracted to, but who believed in me. Mm -hmm. Does every theater career that you've come across have that in it, that sense of, being buffeted and bounced and banged around. Has anybody managed to make their way through it with full intentionality? Yes, I think, I think some of the uh, dynasties do. I think the Redgraves. Mm -hmm. I think the Fondas. I think the families who, you know, you, how many times do you see this and even rock stars and things, they have children. Was your kid going to be in show business? And you know, oh, he's just got a guitar. I think he's going to be OK. And you think, yeah. really? <laughs> so I think those people who, who live in the corridor of privilege mm -hmm. and think of themselves as, a, as special and above the throne, I think it's hard for their kids not to pursue that. Right. Uh, it's very interesting to find out how few famous children of famous parents exist outside the House of Hanover and Tudor. Hmm. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, talent can skip generations, I suppose. Buffet around in strange ways. So let me get back to the let me get back to the pinball metaphor because what, what what's also true is that weird stuff happens. Stuff turns out badly. Things that were supposed to happen don't end up happening, and yet you keep going. So the, the trajectory of the pinball in your life may have been random and subject to odd flippers and the, the machine saying tilt, but you stuck with it. You stuck with it. You at least kept pulling the, I'm going to now destroy this metaphor by stretching it beyond its limit, the <laughs> plunger and sending another ball up, right? That, that's, that to me, reading it is, is you know, I appreciated the metaphor of the pinball as an organizing principle for the book, but I got the sense that there's something deeper in you that got activated, well, that don't kept for, you coming back for more. Well, don't forget, Barry, I stayed on the table. I stayed in the game. Uh -huh. In other words, when I, when I banged into it originally, when it, when it started to happen, when the, when the momentum started to happen, which is when I met Ellis Rabb and APA at the University of Michigan. And I thought, oh, that's it, what they're doing. I want to do that. I've never seen anything more galvanizing, more thrilling than that. That's what I want. I really did see that. And I wanted it, and I went after it to become friends with them, and then to hound Ellis until he hired me, mm -hmm. which I did. I really wanted it. But I stayed then, which is that book, there. Mm -hmm. 
until it disbanded. Houseman lifted me out, sort of took me through Juilliard, got me sort of started on the road with the acting company for a while, right? And then Craig took me in, and I was here for 27 years. Mm -hmm. So it, they're, they're, I stay in the game mm -hmm. because I love the game. And I'm good at it. Yeah, well, that's for sure. <laughs> you know, so Very, that helps. Yeah, right, that really does help. Yeah, that's, uh, that's great. And if I there, did, sorry, excuse me. I didn't mean to, that to sound self-serving. I think, no, I didn't. I, I think it's, it's true of all of us that when you find something that you love doing, if you're lucky enough to be able to make a living doing that, mm -hmm. every day to get up and say, I get to come here and dream. I mean, my God. Yeah, pretty special. I always thought they would find me out, <laughs> arrest me, and put me in a home somewhere. No. Do you know that feeling of I, being, do I'm really I, just a Do thing. I? At a board meeting today, are you kidding me? Of <laughs> uh, Staying in the game really is it, right? That's, that's the art. That's the, that's the art of a life in the arts, isn't it? Staying in. Yep. Because, because there's nothing about it that makes it easy. It's full of incredibly complicated challenges all the time. But staying on the table as the pinball game continues, that's really the art. Well, there's also that word challenge, isn't there? Hmm. If, that, if that attracts you, as opposed to repels you, then you become a challenge junkie. Mm. And you find basically that the challenge is the thing that really ignites you, right. as opposed to something that is comfortable and safe and familiar. Which, and I have lovely, wonderful friends who need to, believe, to belong in a comfortable situation, mm -hmm. to function and do what they do well. Right. So I'm not saying casting aspersions, but if the challenge is what turns you on, then, then you, you find yourself you in a hellhole like this. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, just to refresh everyone's memory, the period in years of the APA, roughly when? What years were we talking 1959 about? 1959 to 1969, they, that, right. that company existed. I wasn't there that long. I, I didn't get in there till like 63. But they, they lasted 10 years. Now, the part of the history lesson that I really, really loved reading, but of course, uh, as somebody in my position, I would, is that that was a period, the, you know, the early 60s, when, for example, a guy named Mac Lowry at the Ford Foundation decided to take millions and millions and millions of dollars of the Ford Foundation's money and plant it in regional theaters around the country. It's a period when universities started building arts departments. Uh, it's a period when some of the great edifices that we revere today, like Lincoln Center and the Kennedy Center, all started getting built. It was a period in the life of the United States when philanthropists decided that what cities needed in order to be cities were theaters. So is there a right place, right time aspect to all this, right? The University of Michigan put some serious money on the table. There are Plenty of anecdotes in the book of Ellis Rabb and others flying to New York to try and see if a grant is going to come through. What was happening in the country that just made that the perfect time for this work to take root? I think it's a continuation of um, the myth that occurred at the end of the Second World War when we stood amongst the nations. Uh, we, we who had been in isolation virtually by ourselves, protected by the Monroe Doctrine over here, um, and God, are we a long way from that now? Um, uh, and nobody talks about the Monroe Doctrine anymore, do they? Well, we should trot that one out while we're at it. <laughs> but at any rate, we were, there we were suddenly standing on the world stage. And we, had, we were parvenu. We, we are still a very young country. Mm. When you look at the, at the nations uh, uh, that have existed you know, for generations and decades and centuries, and here we are just 200, 200 300, not even 300 years out there. Yeah. So I think that suddenly we looked around and we saw what they were doing. Mm -hmm. We saw how those nations were enriched by culture. How they, how they sent that out 
as something they could do. There was our film industry burgeoning and sending our culture faster across the, the oceans than it had ever happened before. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that there was a sense of identification and pride um, uh, that said a great nation deserves a great culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and it does. And it should. I mean, uh, our artists, you know, whether they're working in clay or, 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 or steel or imagination, are the ones filling your minds and your, the minds of your children with a sense of communal identification. And, and I think it's been amazing that this community has supported major theaters. You know, I mean, you, you don't even see it the way we do across the country. Because San Diego, you don't need it. Yeah, everybody loves San Diego. What's not to love? And yet, there's this extraordinary climate of ferocious support and, and pride and a taproot that goes down underneath this theater sure. to the Deep. 20s, yeah. and where the words of Shakespeare have been spoken on this spot in continuum all that period of time. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen very often. You don't know how good you've got it. <laughs> I think they do. I think they do. I think you you helped remind them many, 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 many times. So, uh, so, so here we have this period where there's an enormous amount of burgeoning theatrical activity, and the University of Michigan decides that they want to get in on the game, right? Is that what happened? Well, it's in the book. They were, I, yes. they, were they were shocked. They were shamed into it hmm. because because. And what happened basically is that Tyrone Guthrie, right. who had been at Stratford, Ontario, um, decided that he wanted to start a theater, a regional theater in the States. And he picked three places Ann Arbor, Michigan, Indianapolis, and Minneapolis. And Minneapolis. Right. And Minneapolis. Where he eventually, Where he eventually ended up. Yeah. That's exactly right. And he said to Indianapolis? A, huh? Indianapolis? Yeah. Why? I, he wanted it in the middle of the, of the country. He didn't want to go, he didn't want the, the, coats, the coasts. He wanted the heartland. Uh -huh. And he felt that that was important. He wanted to sort of identify with the real people, not, not the, the intellectuals and not the, not the people on the coast, but the, pe the people that he felt were in need were, uh, and starved for this kind of material. I mean, they only got national companies out right. there. Yeah. So he chose those three places and he announced, Guthrie announced, I'd like to go to your, I'd like to come and work with you. And immediately Indianapolis and Minnesota uh, and, and Minneapolis responded and said, please come. And the University of Michigan was silent. And uh, I don't know why. Hmm. Um, and for whatever reason, they had this very groovy group of highly intellectual uh, avant-garde professors that had their own little thing called the Once Festival. And Roger Reynolds, who I think taught out at the university out here for a while, maybe still does, Gordon Muma, all these very zonky, sort of uh, new, new age, very strange composers were part of this group. And the university was silent. and. And it was, it was sort of shocking because Guthrie said, well, I'm going to these other two cities. And there was a big thing at the university. And they, in, the once festival people invited him to come. Mm. And he actually accepted and came to the campus. And the president, n none of the regents, no one showed up to meet him. And so it was announced that he was going to start this Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis. And there was, as you know, a lot of industry in Minneapolis, Beatrice Foods, and all of that I means suddenly there was so much excitement and so much money and so much pride. And the university was shamefaced. And they scrambled to put together something competitive mm -hmm. because suddenly that was the name of the game. And uh, the, the, the professional theater program was born, stocked, 
uh, conceived and they went out shopping for a company and they found Ellis and Rosemary and at the Fred Miller Theater in Milwaukee hmm. on the road. Wow. It's an amazing story. And that's how I met your grandmother. And there you go. <laughs> yeah. And so let me come back to you now. So you described seeing that thing that they were doing and saying, I want to do that. I want to do that. You're eloquent on that moment in the book. And I don't want to, you know, spoiler alert, but uh, I, I, I actually hope it will incentivize anybody in here who hasn't already decided to buy one to go ahead and do it. Which is, you know, what, what was that? When there you are, a young man, a young student, already with uh, a sense of excitement about language and words and expression, and you saw what they were doing, and it swept you away, rendered you speechless. What, what was it? What was it that you saw them do? Well, for one thing, it was different from anything I had seen, which was a very, very low standard of theatrical experience. Um, university theater, and at that time, was pretty bland. And there were not a lot of professional programs being instituted. You just got whatever was on the faculty, and you did plays. And, and you were excited about it, but there, there didn't seem to be any individual vision and suddenly, this small group of very young, very attractive, very vibrant, very intentional artists uh, stand up and they, instead of being on a big stage, they're on a little stage that they take with them. And it's so filled with a kind of imagination that I'd never seen before, hmm. that I uh, was absolutely poaxed. And, uh, and now that you mention this, that I look back, was it really that good? <laughs> or was I just starved for vision? Hmm. And I think that's... But the vision was the quality that was manifest. It was gorgeous. Yeah. It was sexy. And, and that vision belonged to this man, Ellis Rath. Yeah, it did. Uh, let's talk about him a little bit. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm too young, uh, to forgive me. To, uh, <laughs> he keeps saying it, but he no, doesn't mean it. I do. <laughs> All right. You know, if I take, it's the last chance, you know, the, the days are rolling by. But uh, I, 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 I sadly, it, it's a name, Ellis Rabb, is a name that I heard a lot when I started out in the theater. I worked at Circle in the Square yeah. for 10 bucks a week for Ted Mann. Yeah, sure. And he had done, he continued to do stuff there. But I just was a little too young getting out of college to have actually seen his work um, uh, live myself. But, but, but it, it's, a, it's a big name, a name that looms large in my imagination. And so I was incredibly happy to get a sense of knowing the man through your depiction of him. And, and what I know about him and have known about him, I can see in the productions of yours that I have seen. There is a tremendous flair to your work. I mean, you are the best curtain call stager I have ever seen. Uh, you know, and, and that's just what happens at the end. That's not even to count the two and a half hours that have come before. And I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that's him. It is. That's absolutely him, right? He's legendary for his curtain calls, oh, among God, other they things. They were gorgeous. They right? were great. Yeah. They were great. And I've done a couple of good ones, but he was fantastic. And, yeah. but, I, but it was the philosophy, Barry, because he felt he had you in the audience, and he had to make the entire evening work, not just from the moment that the play finished, but how the actors were presented to the audience. And that moment of exchange where you thank each other, where you are aware that you are not just blank people in the, in the dark, but that the audience is thanking the actors and the actors are seeing the audience. He wanted that, that sense of pride mm -hmm. and, and respect was indigenous and it, it totally influenced me. Yeah. And then I thought, how lovely that you finish the evening in the style of the evening that you watched, right. I, you know. The even, if I do a, even if I do a simple call yeah. or, or a non-musical call, uh, uh, I, it's very important that it have design. In I, I want to come back to Rab in a minute, but do the actors 
y that curtain call for the Scottish play took time to stage, oh, yeah. right? No doubt, amazing, really amazing, among many, many, many amazing things in that production. But uh, the, the actors with you on that, they love it because they know it's, you're gonna make everybody clap really loud. Well, here's the deal. <laughs> so, it's sort of, the, the, the jig is up. They, they, <laughs> They know I do this. You know? yeah. So they know, oh, what's he going to do for a call? And so partially I'm thinking, Jesus, i got to crank out another call for these yeah, people. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're sort of stuck in your own idiotic sure, myth. In your thing, yeah. And you think to yourself, OK. Uh, and and very, I will tell you the truth. That very often, I see the call almost at the very beginning. Huh. When the show is, when I'm, when I'm beginning to see it, what the show is going to be like, I have some idea of right. what that call should be like. That's great. Should it be a company? Should it be individuals? Should I, should I, should I start with everybody with their backs to the audience and then they turn? I yeah. mean, you know, there's all, there are all sorts of things you can do. Sure. And, uh, but, the, but the interesting thing is, that's a, I love that this call has like become a big deal because it's not as good as the call I did for Coast of Utopia. <laughs> Coast of Utopia, had three curtain calls, different for each of the three plays, because the assignments were different. So, so I had to do that. Mm -hmm. Then there was the day when they played in repertory from yeah. 11 till 11 o'clock at night. So I didn't want to end the plays with a curtain call. I wanted there to be a different call at the end. Right. So I did a different call for that. Wow. And. This is a sweet story. The, com the company, we, uh, yes, these take time. And, and, <laughs> and, but the thing is, you don't, you don't want to waste people's time. So if you do this, you're really organized. You know, you know how to move people around. And I do know, I know I'm, I've been taught by masters how to do that. I know how to move people around. That's not a problem. But the design is a problem. And so you have it in your head, and you have a little limited amount of time you have to do it. And so you get this company, because we're, we're going to do the last play in the trilogy. Then, the follow, then I'm going away for a, for a, a week, because I have to start Il Tritico at the Met. So I need to get away to do another trilogy. So I'm not going to see the first uh, uh, full display of, the, of the, the three plays. So I got the company to do this. Thing. We get up to do it, and we, we do the first call, right? And I said, okay. And that's, now this is the last call, so this will be different. You're here in front, and you come through this way, and this will all move this way, then you wait for them, and they come down. Do you get that? Yes, we do, okay. So that's the third call. And I said, what, they are, they're going to do it. I said, just a minute, there's another call. <laughs> what other call? I said, well, there's the call when you do the entire, oh, no, we're not doing it. I said, yes, you are. You're going to do another call. <laughs> So they're sort of giggling about this. And here's what I did. I did this whole thing uh, with all of them together. And then at the end, I brought the entire company downstage. And I made them kneel and put their heads down for five seconds and then get up. And they had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> And, and there were a lot of pulled faces and saying, what is this five seconds of their heads about, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, you just sat all day long in front of this company. This company needs to salute you. Not just to be, thank you, but to pay respect to you, because you've been there since 11 o'clock this morning. I knew what I was doing, right? Yeah. So I'm on a boat down in Cancun or some damn place <laughs> with, the, with the scores to this opera. And I get the texts start coming in from the kids saying, you won't believe what happened. Because of course, they had never experienced it before. And at the end of the day, the, the entire company came down and knelt before the audience. And the audience went crazy. Bonkers. Yeah. That's a curtain. That's a curtain. <laughs> well, that's right. And that's how you get a Tony Award. What? That's how you get a Tony Award. Well, yeah. Yeah, that's how you get a Tony Award. <laughs> Write that down. That's how you do it. Doesn't hurt. Um, so, uh, 
and Rab knew this. Rab was a was He's an brilliant. artist. Yeah, an brilliant. artist. Of curtain. I love the idea that the curtain call comes to you, and you and and in a way you extrapolate backwards into what the production is going to be from yeah. your your in, in instinct about that. He was a man, uh, it would appear, from the book of gigantic appetite mm -hmm. of many kinds. Uh, he was a man of severe intellect and, and a, 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 a pretty voracious reader with a really wide sense of the literature. Wrong. No? Hmm. No. Didn't read anything. Really? <laughs> Didn't read well, at all. First of all, he had problems with his eyes, so that he was uh, always worried about a detached retina. But there was an adage that went around for years um, that I think um, Stephen, um, oh God, names, the other director, Stephen Porter, Stephen, thank you. Stephen Porter said that Ellis has never done a play that Jack hasn't read to him. Hmm. And he did not read voraciously. So you read him plays? You left that out. I got another book in here. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. That's an extraordinary thing. I mean, the relationship, you know, and you just tell me if you don't want to get into any of this. But, oh, but, I don't mind. But the relationship between the two of you was a, a deep love. A deep love, it seems, from, from reading the book. A well, it was, yes, it was not a physical love. No, I understand. I don't mean that. I mean, it, but it was, uh, yeah. Well, because I a, have had a lot of physical love. I understand. <laughs> I do understand. Some of them may be in the room, for all yeah. <laughs> But, I, I, I mean, it, it but was, yes, yes. Yeah, and it yes, would seem I, to me that it was as meaningful to you as any other kind of great love would be, maybe oh, more yeah, so, that no. it was the great love of your life. In, in a sense, yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I loved the proximity with what I assumed to be his genius. Mm -hmm. I loved being close to his creative process because I felt I did not have one. Um, and for many years, I directed in the manner of Ellis Rapp. Hmm. And there are still things that I do today that I know are things, I can feel them, I can see them. I know how to do certain gestures that he used to do with a company that are just good. Hmm. And so I adopted them to my own style, and now I'm somebody else. Yeah. And we all become somebody sure. else. We're you an amalgam integrate of all, these, all people. of these influences get integrated and you come out in some other place. But I was standing next to this furnace all the time. Mm -hmm. And I saw it drunk, and I saw it petty, and I saw it inspired, and I saw it manipulative, and I was very clear about all of those things. I, I did not, um, it's probably great that we were never attracted to each other. Mm because that, that would bring another uh, completely baffling element into it. Uh, he had no interest in me, nor I in him. And, and your age, comparatively, was? Nine years different. Nine years different. So it's like a, a, a really big older brother, uh -huh. but a crazy one. Because <laughs> he was manic depressive, and he was alcoholic, and he was loopy, and he was, he was thrilling. But, um, uh, but there I was. I was Sucking that yeah. stuff Extraordinary up. energy. Is it possible to be a genius at his level and not have demons that great? In your experience through a life in art, have you, have you come across well-adjusted geniuses? <laughs> that's a great question. It, it, it's no, one, I, don't, it's not, I think that's... I actually, the, the, it, 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 is a, it is a serious preoccupation of mine, well, whether I, it is possible to be a great genius and be a normal human being. Well, Chekhov would seem to be the, the instance that it is, that it is possible to be a giant, earth-shaking genius and be a perfectly wonderful human being. Stoppard is too. Mm. Tom Stoppard is very much like that. Mm -hmm. He's a massive intellect, and one of, the, one of the people for whom the Middle English term gentilessa was coined. He's a gentleman. Yeah. 
Mm. And, and there's something so incredibly kind about him. Um, so I don't think he is. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I think Ellis and Bill Ball were twin sort of Chartres-like peaks of their generation, were both extraordinarily, had genius about them, and they both burned out. Mm -hmm. uh, I have never believed that I have genius in me, and I'm still working. Mm. And so, uh, but I, I, I'm with you. I think the really tortured ones are the ones that fascinate me, mm. and I don't have that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in a room full of them, there needs to be somebody who's sane, <laughs> or the entire thing just goes off the rails, right? I mean, I, I don't know about you, again and again, you know, we, we cast plays, and we'll say, that's the actor that I want, and people will say, oh my God, he's crazy, you can't, he's crazy. But, you know, you do it, and you end up in the room, you find out, that's right, he's crazy, <laughs> but the, you know, you, you do it. Right? Well, I have, this, I have this feeling, I mean, you probably do too. Uh, uh, you know, if, if they deliver the divine madness, it's worth it. Mm. I'll, I'll put up with anything if you get it. But if they're torturous to the people back here and the people over there, and they don't deliver, I don't ever want to see them yeah. again. But, but again, you know, spoiler alert, your love with Ellis Rabb ended badly. It did. It? it ended badly. Here. Right here. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, look, people are either getting better or they're getting worse. Don't you find that true? Um, people, we become more of what we are as we get older, as we have less and less tolerance for other people. And so when you have... Uh, when you are a, ch a very challenging personality and you add uh, manic depression to that and you add alcoholism to that, yeah. um, you, you, that's, a, that's a pretty potent cocktail. But you know what I thought reading it? I thought it was not that you loved Caesar less but that you loved Rome more. I did. That the globe was getting severely damaged. I said to him when I fired him from this stage, playing Pygmalion, playing Henry Higgins. He, he, Tom Hall and I went skiing after the opening of Pygmalion because we had had it. It had been a brutal rehearsal period and we were challenged because Ellis was drinking and he was also brilliant and, and it was a lot of good friends and it was an expensive production and we worked very hard and we got it on just. And we went skiing that week. We went up to Mammoth uh, just to get out of our heads. And during that period, we had, in those days, we were doing student matinees as well. So they had, I think, I, I think it was a nine performance week, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. It might have been more. And I think of the nine performances, Ellis played five. His understudy went on for the others. And we came back on a Sunday, and on Saturday, a friend of his came to the matinee, and he played. And then he and the friend went out for dinner that night, and he had a bottle of wine, and called in sick. And my leading lady, who was hysterical, said, I don't care who plays it, just one person, please. And I went over the next day and fired him. And I said, Al, you, you mean the world to me. And you can do anything you want to to me as a friend. But you cannot insult this theater. And I'm firing you. Hmm. And it was, to be perfectly frank, it was probably the making of me. Hmm. Really? Oh, yeah. Wow. It, really? was, it was, oh, sure. Because, I mean, Talk about an eatable moment. <laughs> and, and he didn't believe me. Mm -hmm. he, did, he thought I was kidding. And then he never forgave me. To his dying day, he never forgave me for it. Mm. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I'm not. You know, if they drag you down, fuck them. <laughs> You know what I mean? We're 
We're going to get letters. We're going to get letters. You heard it here. Um, the other giant who looms large in the book, and I presume will be the center of the next book, is, of course, Craig Knoll. Yeah. In the time that I've been here at the Globe, I've heard an enormous amount about him. Um, uh, it's wonderful for me to hear uh, so much about him. And uh, as with Ellis Rabb, I never had the privilege and pleasure of experiencing the work personally. But I do feel like I'm somehow in touch with the spirit of the man. Um, which, of course, suffuses every square inch of this uh, place. And I'm really looking forward to the next book to get to know him as well. But there is one thing about him that I really want to ask you, which is uh, the subject of a lot of water cooler discussion here at the Globe. So many of the Globe staff have read the book. What was the deal with the swimming pool at his house? We all got laid. <laughs> That swimming pool, like, I, first of all, I couldn't decide whether it's a pool I wanted to go into or a pool I wanted to stay the hell away from. First of all, I just want to say this, because this, this was sort of different. I'd never seen this before. He had this great backyard, it's small, and it was all tiled and, you know, very Craig. Like, Craig was, he, everything he touched was sort of his own kind of weird magic. And the pool was navy blue. It wasn't aqua. Hmm. It was navy blue. So there was something sort of grotto-like about it. And it was, it, was like, it was party time. It was just great. Let me just say something, because this is, those two men loved each other. Craig adored Ellis and brought him back here repeatedly. And Ellis worshipped Craig and would have done anything for Craig. They were diametrically opposite. Hmm. Uh, the imperialism, the, the imperiousness, the the uh, audacity, the, the theatricality that Ellis demonstrated just getting out of a car. <laughs> yeah. I'm Irish. Yeah. Um, was the antithesis of, of Craig. Craig was the most modest, self-effacing, giggly, elfin person you'd ever know in your life. He was, he was like a hobbit. He was like... <laughs> He was, he, was, he was tenderness and, and wicked, charming laughter, but he was not a threat ever. But it, that sweetness, that gentleness, that kindness, which was so unusual in the theater, hmm. uh, belied a steel will. Uh, it, those who loved him and knew him best knew that he was sprung steel. Hmm. And in the book, in this next book, there will be a recitation of an opportunity that there may be one or two people alive here that remember this, that he, Craig had taken great, great affection and care of Bill Ball, who also rose to huge prominence here very, very early in his career and did some of his most outrageous and wonderful things here. And Bill tried to take this theater away from Craig. And Bill went, he, there, everybody's dead now, so I can tell you this. <laughs> Bill went categorically to the board members and started saying, I, I want to take, it's time for him to go. Hmm. Wow. And he rose like the wrath of God. <laughs> that little teddy bear guy. Hmm. He banished Bill from the theater, from the park, and from San Diego. Wow. Amazing. And it was in the 80s that I, myself, instituted a reconciliation between the two of them. Hmm. They had not seen each other or spoken in 20 years. And I thought before it was over, they should get back together, and they you. did. Good for you. Two yeah, giants. Two giants. Unbelievable. And again, but, but you, you, you sort of missed Craig if you weren't paying attention. Huh. You would not I'm say. I find that so hard to believe. You would not say, this is the guy. Uh, once you're in his presence, you'd get it, because mm -hmm. he was magic. But, but he did not come on that way mm -hmm. at all. But he knew what he wanted. He got what he wanted. 
He made this board do what he, what he, he actually made it happen. And what I saw here was a template for something that could really be something quite different. Yeah. But I was very often praised when I came here for keeping Craig on. Mm -hmm. And they said, what a sweet thing it was. Of course, we loved each other. And he was, we were so close, but I didn't. I kept Craig on because he was the best damn director I knew. Hmm. And he was here. Why would I turn my back on a, I mean, his verisimilitude, his climate, a naturalistic drama was as good as anything I've ever seen anyone really? do. Yeah. And I had the great pleasure of bringing outside actors to a man who had made love to this community and this community of actors. He only worked with the people here. Hmm. And the, I made him hire Harry Groner. <laughs> the first season for a play called Billy Bishop Goes to War. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he fought me tooth and nail. And I said, you, you're going to do this for me. You're going to do this for me. It's a one-man show. I want the one. I said, no, you're going to hire this guy. And of course, they had the time of their life. And suddenly, the world opened to hmm. Craig. And the world understood who Craig was. It was great. That's great. Good for you. Yeah, good for him. Yeah. So Jack, we're going to open the floor to questions in a moment. But I want to ask you one personal thing. You know, I, I, uh, when I first got out here, I was introduced to a lot of folks around and spent a lot of time uh, over meals, lunches, and dinners, and breakfasts. And it was my habit for the first few months of those meetings to um, ask everybody that I met if they would give me one piece of advice. What's the, what's the one piece of advice you would give to the new guy? And you know, I got lots of keep the plays no longer than 90 minutes was one <laughs> memorable one that I got. You know, do more Shakespeare, do less Shakespeare. Do more musicals, do fewer musicals. But a lot of, a lot of really wonderful insights uh, about San Diego. So I'm, I'm going to ask you, and then I'm going to turn I'm going to stop being selfish and turn you back over to your adoring crowd here. Give me, what's the one piece of advice you would give me? 27 years in the chair that I'm now fortunate enough to occupy. Get up tomorrow morning and come back to work. <laughs> <laughs> There's no secret to it. That's it. Show you're, up. You're, show up. I mean, you know, you're screwed. You, <laughs> You know, I, I, I said that. I meant it. You're the right guy for this. You're, and, and Tom is here tonight, and he knows that. And we, were, we couldn't have a say in it. We didn't have a say in it. We didn't say anything about it. We were overwhelmed. And, and you know, all I hear, and which I was not hearing in the interregnum, in the years that <laughs> after I left, did not hear this. All I hear is what a great guy you are and what a wonderful job you're doing. Wow, thank you. Let us take some questions from your fans. We have to get the lights a house. They're coming. Oh, good. There Thanks, Tony. Go. Mike and Justin have microphones. So uh, Just raise a hand if you anybody want. have anything they want to ask Jack? OK, Mike, up there. Uh, Jack, my wife and I were privileged uh, in 2007 to see Il Tritico and Coast of Utopia in a trip to New York, and we did one of the Saturday marathons. Oh, wow. And it was two very different productions, one with very different kinds of stagecraft. But I was curious about the, uh, the ending of uh, Johnny Skiki, where the entire set sinks into the basement, and another set comes down. Was that you? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, Congratulations. I mean, no, if you know the opera and you know the end of Johnny's Kiki, there's this gorgeous, Puccini does this extraordinary thing uh, after the, after, it's like a benediction. <laughs> and you think to yourself, God, that's beautiful music. What are we going to do about this? And uh, because it's the Met, you know, and I said, they, I said, couldn't we take advantage of that? And we had had the, uh, the ingenue go up on the roof, and then the, 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 the farce is all over, and you hear them chasing 
Johnny Skiki chasing the, all of them out of the place, and there's a, we timed it, it worked out, that the set just fell, and there behind you was a roof garden with swimming pools and Florence in the background, because it, it was, was like, wonderful piece of it was so beautiful. And, and what I really wanted, what I really wanted, but I couldn't do it, is to have a little airplane go across. Well. <laughs> <laughs> the New York Times said it was the most elaborate opera that season for the Met, which is saying It's the biggest something. set they've ever done, including the... Including the, the crazy ring that they yeah, have now? Yeah, it's, yep. so they said it's something like 15 trucks in Jersey. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. amazing. Someone over here. Hi, Jack. Um, Thank you. <laughs> um, I've been lucky enough to spend some time with you, and you've told me in the past many times over I don't have a rearview mirror, and yet you have a book that is, in a sense, a rearview mirror. So I want, was just wondering. How do I you, reconcile that? Yeah. Well, I think what the rearview mirror means to me, I can't ever tell you what I was doing in a certain period of time. I don't know the years. I, I only look forward. I really don't look back. The book is that journey is like, um, it's like putting yourself into a different mindset. It's not like, what did I do last year, or when did I do that production of Damn Yankees, or what was the year in which I did my, my what are the two years of the two Othellos? I, can't, I have no idea. I, I just don't know. But, but if you ask me to revisit a moment in my life, and I can take myself into it, I can do that. Now, John Houseman told me years ago that when he was writing his, his three books, he said he would get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, because that's the way very old people do. We all get up. <laughs> you have to go to the bathroom anyway, so you might as well stay up. <laughs> so uh, he would get up at 5 o'clock, and he would sit down, and he'd start to write. And he would go back to those days in Hollywood, or the days of the Mercury Theater. And he said there were days in which the, what was happening to him was less real than what it was that he was writing and remembering. And that's happened to me, where I suddenly find myself like in another country. And that isn't the same thing as, as being able to call to mind people, or events, or productions, or where I was on the night of. That's what I mean. I just, I'm only looking this way, so. Yes. Another one. Over here. Mike, you got? I'm not doing uh, this. Can we pass it? All right, in the center. Ooh, that's hard. How do you choose your projects, Jack, and is there one that you'd really, really like to do? Everybody asked me that about, um, d did I, you know, is there some play you've always wanted to do? And I did them. I mean, I, I did them for you. I, I, I did, I only choose the things that I, well, here's my little, my little t-shirt is, uh, there's nothing worse than a failure you didn't believe in. And so if I am moved by it or touched by it or feel that it, I, I know, I understand the story, then I'm, I, I want to do it. But, uh, you, there's a point in your career when you just do what you're given or what you're lucky enough to get a job. And, and you can learn a great deal about directing and about your life by doing that. But after a while, you have to choose very carefully, carefully because you have a responsibility to the accumulation of the work and to the people you're doing the work for. So you want to make sure that you don't pick it up if you can't do it. And that has to do with just simply uh, believing it. Uh, if it, if I don't, if it doesn't move me to laughter or tears, I can't do it, and I don't. Do you read reviews? <laughs> less and less. <laughs> I mean, you know, you 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 have to stop. First of all, you have to put it in perspective. Um, we're not children in school any longer. So teacher isn't sitting there 
with the with the right answer, and you have to get a certain mark on your on your on your paper, or you don't pass. Um, we also have to realize that they are fallible, and they have prejudices, the critics, and they have their own weaknesses, and they have their own uh, things that they dislike. But guys, they're trying to sell a newspaper. They're not sitting in a, you know, one of the great problems with criticism is there aren't critics, there are reviewers. And the reviewers will tell you their impression of what happened. But a critic has a standard against which things are judged. And you, as the person reading the critic, know their intellectual makeup and what they stand for. Then you know where you are on the scale. But people who are just flinging poison darts at you because it makes good copy must not be paid attention to. Now, I will tell you, the proliferation of what goes on on the internet now means that any asshole can do that. <laughs> and do they? And they do. They all think that they're critics, and they all think they know what it is, and they all are dying to explain it to you. And I have had my heart broken by, by looking at something that was in really important to me and seeing somebody make papier mache mess out of it. And I thought to myself, well, here's the deal. If you're going to believe the good ones, you've got to believe the bad ones. So it's really not good to believe any of them. <laughs> uh, Tyrone, was it Guthrie? Yes, it was Guthrie who said, famously, I thought, I have never read a review from which I gained any insight or learned anything of value about what I had done wrong. Consequently, I only like to receive good reviews. <laughs> <laughs> Words to live by. Let's take one more question, and then we're going to let Jack sign some books. Justin? Very good. Thank you. I'd love to be last. <laughs> It's so great to see you again, Jeff. We've really missed you. Thank you. Um, I work with children who were very much like you in grade school, who are extremely challenged by the daunting future ahead of them. And so I have dedicated myself for years to taking these kids to the theater constantly, to all kinds of theater. And it's magical when they say, like you said, that's what I want to do. I can do that. And when I listen to this, I think, well, sure, you can do that if you only had grit. And it seems to me that that's what you have had through your trying years, through those difficult times. You never gave up, regardless of who said what about you. You continued on. So my question is, is grit something that is developed, or is it inherited, or is it something that is taught by those of us who care enough? I don't think you can teach that. Um, I think one finds it within oneself if one finds a path that is supported by the results. If you're banging your head against the cement wall and it doesn't feel good, you stop doing it. But if you sing opera and people want to come and hear you sing, it's the way you find what you are meant to do. I don't know how to answer that except to say that what is so moving about this community and this audience is that, as we well know, nobody ever wanders into a theater by themselves. Somebody takes you. An aunt, a teacher, a parent, somebody takes you to the theater for the first time. And this piece behind you was my attempt to compete with stage magic so that little children would have their first experience with every piece of stagecraft I could throw at them, <laughs> as opposed to be looking at a little screen. Because I th that's what happened to me. And that's sort of what happened to you. And I think that, that 
if we have a generation of people, I mean, I worry now because theater is so expensive and that tickets are so expensive. I'm not sure who we're doing, you know, when, when, when you're paying $136 a ticket to see a revival in New York. Uh, what's that about? Who are we doing these plays for? Uh, we should be doing them for young people who can come and see them. Uh, and until that really gets worked out, I am in despair. But um, I do hope that those of you with the capacity to bring somebody into a place where they can exercise their imagination in, in a community situation will continue to do it because we won't survive without No, not at right? all. My, my six-year-old daughter has been swept up by this production and insists on seeing it again and again. So, oh, that's great. Uh, yes, it is. She loves it, and it's a wonderful, wonderful production. Ladies and gentlemen, this book is uh, on sale in the lobby. Jack will be out there in a few moments to sign it. Jack, the door of the Old Globe is always open to you. I hope I will one day convince you to come here and make your triumphant directing return to one of our stages. We'll work it out. Um, I, uh, I, I want to say again, uh, I, I want to say again on a, on a personal note, I thank you so very, very much for your support. It's meant a great deal to me as I've gotten started out here and I am conscious of the support that you have sent my way and I'm grateful. And all I can really say to you is, um, you know, I hope that I can achieve just the tiniest fraction of what it is you have done. And if I manage to do that, I will consider myself the most successful man in California. You're doing it already. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Jack. That's the best interview I've ever had. Oh, I'm serious. Fun. Love talking to you. Jack O'Brien. Yeah, just take a bow. <laughs>